Hey, what's going on everyone? Greg here. And when Apple released the 16 inch MacBook Pro almost one year ago, it was a clear improvement over the last iteration and remains one of my favorite Apple laptops of any currently available in the lineup. However, should you buy one now nearly one year later? Well, first off, let's revisit the 16 inch MacBook Pro and go over some of the basics. The 16 inch MacBook Pro is the biggest laptop in Apple's lineup, weighing in at 4.3 pounds. Its chassis is also slightly thicker than the previous 2019 15 inch iteration, but it doesn't accommodate any more ports than you're used to since the 2016 redesign. It's still just four Thunderbolt 3 USB-C ports, which support USB-C charging of 100 watts connection to a Thunderbolt 5K or 6K displays, external GPUs, and other useful accessories like this dock that Anchor sent over to me. Anchor is not sponsoring the video, but this powerful and small Thunderbolt 3 dock shows you just how forward thinking Apple was with this port decision. One single cable can power a SD card, micro SD card, two USB-C ports, two Thunderbolt 3 ports, four USB-A, a headphone jack, and an ethernet port. I know for my video editing workflows, I'll have up to three solid state hard drives connected at once, so powerful ports like this are really helpful for driving these accessories. If you wanna check out this Anchor docking station, I'll leave an affiliate link in the description below. Now, even though I do really like Thunderbolt 3 USB-C ports, they're reversible. Like I said, they carry 40 gigabits of data, so they're super powerful. Would it have been too much trouble, Apple, just to add a SD card slot as someone who does video, and I'm sure a lot of people who are buying the 16-inch MacBook Pro are video professionals who like to edit in Final Cut Pro 10. An SD card slot, I'm just saying, would be a useful little addition. Other than that, like its name suggests, the 16-inch MacBook Pro packs in a 16-inch Retina display with a resolution of 3072 by 1920, which again, if you're doing the math, that's 226 pixels per inch, which is the same pixels per inch as any other MacBook in the lineup. It also has 500 nits of brightness and Apple's True Tone display technology. The bezels are also the smallest on any laptop that Apple currently sells, and even recent updates to the expensive 13-inch MacBook Pro have not received the same bezel reduction treatment as the 16-inch MacBook Pro. And it allows you to change the display's refresh rate below 60 hertz. I mock this, but apparently this can be a helpful tool for filmmakers who work with 24 FPS footage. I am not a filmmaker, but one day, Travis, I'm gonna make this Hollywood movie completely out of spite. And for my Hollywood award-winning documentary, I think I'm going to take a topic that all of us can agree with, and that is that a hot dog is not a sandwich. Other than that, it's pretty much the same Apple display we've been using on the MacBook Pro since around 2016, which is to say good. I always like the look of Apple displays, and their colors are pretty accurate right out of the box. The bigger display is also great for multitasking and definitely having more room in your workspace, but it's also generally just a great laptop as a portable theater setup. There's been a few times where I put my 16 inch MacBook Pro in the middle of a table to watch some Netflix during dinner, and even a few times where we set it up to watch some shows while hanging out with friends. The reason this also works so well is because of the speaker system where Apple has improved it dramatically. The six speaker sound system with those dual canceling subwoofers provide rich, clear sound with a good amount of bass, even at higher volumes. It makes the laptop excel as a music, podcast, and TV watching portable solution. And these are the best laptop speakers I have ever heard. And even the newer 2020 MacBook Air and 13 inch MacBook Pro simply can't compete. The studio quality microphone adds even more versatility for how great this laptop already is. The inbuilt microphone sounds great. I wouldn't replace my main podcasting microphone with it, but as a microphone where I have to use it on the go to add to audio projects or redo a line I messed up in a take on a video, it's a microphone that I've used in quite a few videos already and I'm sure most people haven't even noticed. The webcam is a different story and the lackluster 720p webcam is really starting to show its awfulness in these times of social distancing. Now what isn't awful is the keyboard. When I first reviewed the 16 inch MacBook Pro around 10 months ago, it was the first Apple laptop with the brand new Magic Keyboard. That replaced the unreliable butterfly switch mechanisms with the more traditional tried and true scissor switch mechanisms. Since that review, every single laptop in Apple's lineup has now switched over to this new keyboard design. The keyboard has continued to grow on me ever since my initial review. I really like the increased travel along with still maintaining a lot of the stability and punchiness of the butterfly keyboard. It kind of takes 
what Apple was trying to do with the butterfly keyboard and brings that over to the scissor switch mechanism and overall just creates a really comfortable keyboard to type on. But then you look at the top of the keyboard and you get to the touch bar and that touch bar still remains uninspired. I do find uses for it and there are some programs that utilize it quite well. Affinity Photo is an excellent example of this and you can use the touch bar for useful things like resizing brush tools. However, Apple's overall lack of commitment to the touch bar experience is painfully apparent after four years of little to no innovation. The touch bar isn't a feature you should spend extra money for, it's just there whether you like it or not. I honestly think the touch bar's days are getting increasingly numbered, and this could be the last couple of generations that include a touch bar, and I think Apple might actually get rid of it when they switch over to using their own Apple silicon-based chips. I should note that Touch ID is infinitely more useful than the Touch Bar, though, and works extremely well at unlocking your MacBook Pro, but anyone who has used the iPad Pro with its new Magic Keyboard accessory knows that Face ID would be the superior solution for faster unlock times and no need to place your finger on the keyboard. Like I said before, this is the biggest laptop in Apple's lineup. It also means it's the least portable and heaviest in the lineup, comparing it against its smaller sibling like the 13-inch MacBook Pro. The 13-inch has significantly less volume than the 16-inch, making it more of an ideal choice for the portable laptop user. However, that's not to say traveling with the 16-inch Pro is completely out of line or even that inconvenient all in all. And the reasons for this bigger design and weight go beyond just screen size. Apple decided to take this 16-inch Pro and throw in a redesigned thermal system that handles thermal so much better, even with the same 9th generation Intel CPU as the previous 15-inch version. Which means you get better performance overall because the laptop can cool the CPUs more effectively. Apple also took the time to add an even bigger battery to the 16-inch. Apple is packing in a 100 watt hour battery, and this makes it the biggest battery in their laptop lineup. That battery has been powering this 16-inch MacBook Pro very well over the past 10 months I've been using it, and when you consider the CPU, RAM, and GPU power this thing sucks up compared to the smaller laptops in Apple's lineup, the battery life is still commendable. It is rated for 11 hours on Apple's website, but in my usage I would say to expect anywhere from 8 to 10 hours of battery life with mixed usage, and depending on what apps you use, pro tip, use Safari over Chrome for better battery life. I should also note the model I'm using right now is the 2.3 GHz 8-core i9 with 32GB of RAM and a Radeon Pro 5500M with 8GB of GDDR6 memory. Complete with one terabyte of storage, that overall package will net you $3,299. Although you can get a 16-inch MacBook Pro at the entry-level price for as low as $2,400, and actually the entry-level models, if you're going with the 6-core or the 8-core processor, are respectable this year. And the overall performance of the 16-inch MacBook Pro has just been great. For editing 4K videos in Final Cut Pro 10, editing raw photos, making music tracks in Logic Pro, editing podcasts, and most of the other demanding tasks that I would do on a daily basis. In my video where I compared every single current MacBook in the lineup, the 16-inch Pro was over twice as fast as exporting video as the $1,799 version of the 13-inch MacBook Pro, exporting a 10-minute 4K video file in 4 minutes and 32 seconds. This extra speed is essential for people who make a living off this kind of work, where the old adage of time is money really does apply. And the improved thermal design really does make this machine more pleasant to work on, as the fans seem to spin up less often, and when they do ramp up to that infamous MacBook fan sound, it is less pronounced than what you would find on the 13-inch MacBook Pro and even the MacBook Air. Overall, it does a much better job at dissipating heat during most tasks. Don't get me started on how hot the 13-inch Pro was during my review, but also don't get me wrong, the fans will still spin up eventually on the 16-inch during heavy tasks, especially when you're exporting a video. Even the graphical performance in this laptop is so much better than the previous iteration of the 15-inch version. And in my opinion, it's the only serious option for anyone who is shopping for a MacBook right now who needs good graphics. That's thanks to the new AMD 5000 series of GPUs. The 16-inch MacBook Pro is the only laptop that Apple sells that has a dedicated graphics card. This particular graphics card mostly excels at pro-level tasks like video editing for faster render times. However, it's also a pretty competent GPU if you want to do some side gaming by loading up Windows onto this laptop, enabling me to play modern titles like Battlefield 5 and Destiny 2. 
I have an earlier video where I covered the full gaming experience on the 16 inch MacBook Pro. Again, find it right up here. Dollar for dollar, obviously, it's not going to compete with Windows gaming laptops, but if you want a Mac and you still wanna play a few game titles, this 16 inch MacBook Pro is more than capable and it gets better GPU performance out of a standard PS4 or Xbox One. And just a month or two ago, Apple even added an additional graphics option for an extra $600 that promises even more performance, but I do not have that model to test for this video. I should also note that we now know that Apple is planning to transition their entire Mac lineup over to their own custom Apple Silicon chips. And this 16 inch MacBook Pro is capable of boot camping into Windows to access that bigger library of games. So if that is something you want to do on your MacBook Pro, this last generation of the Intel Macs are so far the only ones that are going to be able to boot camp into Windows. At least right now, it looks like you're not going to be able to load up Windows on these new ARM-based Macs. Something you might wanna consider, but I'm gonna to touch on that a little bit more at the end. Now, as I sit here publishing this review today, I'm sure some of you have noticed throughout the video that I was using sometimes a different operating system, and that's because I was. I currently have the Mac OS Big Sur Developer Beta 2 installed on the 16 inch MacBook Pro. Now this is probably the last video I'll do on the 16 inch MacBook Pro and I thought that I should test it on Mac OS Big Sur, even though it is in beta, I wanted to give some insight into that operating system as people who purchase this 16 inch MacBook Pro today, in about a couple of months when Apple does release Mac OS Big Sur, the final version of it, this will be your new operating system. But again, this is a beta, so you can take this section with a little bit of a grain of salt if you wish. Mac OS Big Sur brings a much more modern design aesthetic over to the Mac. Very similar to some of the design language you would see on an iPad Pro. New icons, control center, widgets, menu bar, and added transparency give it a fresh modern look and feel. Improved enhancements to Safari give you 50% faster performance and also more battery efficiency versus Chrome and Firefox, which Apple says will give you three more hours of battery life when streaming video and one more hour during standard web browsing. There's also much needed improvements to the Messages app that bring it to feature parity with the iOS version. Big Sur also brings back Mac OS favorites like the battery life estimator, letting you know how much time you have left before you should charge your laptop and even the classic boot up sound. And so far, knock on wood, Mac OS Big Sur has been extremely stable and hasn't really impacted my performance in any notable way. However, as much as I like the redesign of Big Sur, this is an operating system that I think is intended more for the next generation of Macs. Speaking of which, let's address that big elephant in the room right now. Apple at its worldwide developer conference announced that it is planning to transition the entire Mac laptop lineup over to their own custom Apple Silicon chips. In the simplest terms, it means maybe better performance, but more importantly, it will probably address the weaknesses for most of Apple's laptops, which include battery life, thermals, and maybe adding some other new features. So by watching this video, you should be made fully aware that Apple plans to complete this transition in two years. So if you're buying any sort of Intel-based Mac now, just know that the future of the Mac is not Intel. How those ARM Macs perform, what sort of problems they might run into, we can only speculate at this point and we can only speculate how long Apple will continue to support their Intel Macs. They said that they are committed to supporting them, but again, those are just words, but given Apple's track record, I think we could at least expect around four years of support for Intel Macs and maybe even more. However, if you're looking to buy a laptop today, and that's probably why you're watching this video, you want to know, even after all the praise I gave this laptop, should you buy now or should you wait? And I fully acknowledge that this is not a simple answer. Number one, we don't quite yet know how Apple's custom chips will perform in a 16 inch MacBook Pro. We can easily guess that Apple's chips would be better for the 13 inch MacBook Pro and MacBook Air, but we have not seen Apple Silicon that competes with bigger eight core processors like the ones that Intel provides just yet. Personally, if you were to ask me, I fully believe that Apple is capable enough to make their own custom chip 
that could not only compete with Intel, but blow it out of the water in terms of performance. But even me saying that is completely 100% speculation as Apple has yet to really prove themselves. We also don't know when the 16 inch is exactly slated to be replaced with Apple Silicon. Most recent rumors say sometime in the middle of next year, which is still a long way to go if you're in the market for a laptop today. So ultimately my buying advice is this. If you have a current Apple laptop that is working just fine and you're on the fence about upgrading to the 16 inch and you can still hold on to your current laptop for one or two more years, I would wait as long as possible to replace your current laptop. That way you can make the most informed decision possible. However, if you're in the market for a laptop today and your laptop broke yesterday or you desperately need a replacement, I'm not the one who's going to tell you to wait one or two years, especially if you're buying a 16 inch MacBook Pro, you are likely trying to do some more creative tasks. You are likely trying to maybe make your own YouTube channel, maybe start making music, maybe start a podcast, all these other creative professional things that if I tell you to wait one to two years, that's a really long time to be waiting when you could be working on some really important tasks. And yes, I think the 16 inch MacBook Pro is still worth it even 10 months after release. This is my favorite laptop that Apple currently sells and packs a bunch of features that make it Apple's most versatile and powerful laptop. I still recommend this laptop, especially if you don't buy directly from Apple and use a third party site. For example, Amazon has the base model of the 16 inch MacBook Pro at just $2,000. That's $400 off the original price. And for around $2,000, that is a really great price on the 16 inch MacBook Pro. Again, that price is as of the making of this video, so hopefully that stays up for the duration of this video's lifetime. And I'll leave an affiliate link in the description if you're interested in purchasing a 16 inch MacBook Pro. But anyway, hopefully this video helped you out. If it did, make sure you leave me a like. If you wanna see more from my channel, make sure you're subscribed. Also be sure to let me know in the comments below, do you agree with me that the 16 inch MacBook Pro is ultimately still worth it? Or would you honestly just recommend waiting for the Apple Silicon Max no matter what? Also, if you wanna connect more with me and make sure you get constant updates, make sure you're following me over on Twitter. And as always, thank you so much for watching and I will see you all in the next video. Take care everyone.